This is Joe Lawyer, Editor-in-Chief of Consortium News. This is a special show we have tonight. We have two guests. They're going to talk about a very, very important rally that will be taking place in Kingston, New York, on Saturday, two days from now. First guest is Gerald Salenti. He's the publisher of Trends Journal and organizer of this rally. And then Scott Ritter, of course, the former UN weapons inspector, U.S. Marines intelligence officer and writer and journalist and geostrategic analyst and a columnist for Consortium News. Thank you, Gerald and Scott, for being here. Gerald, what has led you to organize this rally on Saturday? Well, I've been doing this for 10 years. I launched Occupy Peace. And um, Occupy Peace, part of the foundation of it is close all the bases overseas. What do you got? We're 900 bases in about 80, 90 countries. What the hell are we doing over there? Bring home the troops, secure the homeland, and put the troops to work to rebuild our rotted third world infrastructure. And you want to go to war? Let the people vote. Not these little chicken hawks. Not these little gutless boys and girls over there that love war. They call them congressmen and senators. So that's Occupy Peace. And I was going to have it in uh, May. And Judge Napolitano, who will be a speaker here as well, said, you know, we should have it in September in the run up to the election. I said, yeah, you're right. And who would have thought that the global situation of World War III would be heating up the way it is now? Well, we decided this several months ago. We are in a very critical time right now. To have the rally at a time when Israel has or is attacking Lebanon as the little guy that plays the piano with his penis, the sitcom guy that became president of Ukraine, is in the United States and they just stole another, what, $8.7 billion of our money to give to him. And Biden said, we're not going to say how they're going to use this. This is a critical time. World War III's already begun. There's going to be a false flag event. Something's going to happen to make it official. And nuclear war. I mean, you just heard what Putin came out yesterday. It was Wednesday. And he said that what's going on with the West and the advanced countries supplying Ukraine with all these weapons, and if we feel Russia is being threatened, we're going to use nuclear weapons. He said it. And there's not a word about peace. You know, what, where were all these Quakers? Were they dying in an earthquake? Were the Seventh-day Adventists waiting for the eighth day? Where are the Catholics? Where are the Baptists? The Episcopalians? Where were the Methodists? Where are all these so-called religious people? How come they're not out there for peace? Hey, remember that one that you believe in? You know, Moses came down with the Ten Commandments. And, and it says, thou shalt not kill. Hey, how about that little clown boy, that little arrogant jerk over there in Pennsylvania, Josh Shapiro, signing his name on a howitzer weapon, applauding that Zelensky's there. Oh, signing your name on a weapon to kill people? This is America? This is not America. Again, by the way, just to give you a little background of this, and talking about me putting this together, Scott Ritt has done more than I have to make this happen. What he's done to make this happen and, and, and the passion and what he's put into this, the time, it's making it as great as it can be. Going back, this is on the four corners of freedom. It's the most historic four corners in America. The only place with pre-revolutionary war stone buildings. The seeds of democracy were sown here. When Kingston was the capital of New York State, I went to jury duty. That's how I know this. And the guy putting on the thing said, you see that picture over my shoulder? That's John Jay. John Jay was a judge here. And when the Constitution for New York State was written, over 70% of it that was written right here is the United States Constitution. That's why I bought these three buildings, because I believe in what this country was founded for and the founding fathers. 
and you read George Washington's farewell address, basically, without going into the wording, by which I will do, he said, don't get involved in these foreign entanglements. This shit's been going on for centuries. And it's none of our business. Don't hate a nation, don't love a nation. Because if you do to either one, you become a slave to it. And that's what we've become. But little clown boys, like that guy that's our defense secretary, you know, they dress up with all these little Boy Scout costume things they got on there. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, that guy, Lloyd Austin, they call people like me an isolationist. Hey, how about go F yourself? Oh, you love going over to Iraq and killing those people, didn't you? No, I like it better in Afghanistan. Oh, and you lost both wars, didn't you? Yeah, but we stole about eight, ten million dollars from you, the plantation workers of slave land, you to give to the military industrial complex. And we only killed over well over a million people. What the hell are you complaining about? Oh, and you had a nice exit from Afghanistan, didn't you? Oh, yeah. And we're going to stop those Chinese. All right. You got a bunch of freaks. It's a freak show. And we're trying to stop that. And it does not take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority, keen on setting brush flies of freedom in the minds of men, said Samuel Adams. And that is what changed this country, less than 5% of the people. And that's what we need to do right now. We're in charge, not them. Get this in your head, you little boys and girls that have this bad attitude called politicians. You're a public servant, capish. We tell you what to do. You got it backwards. And that's what this rally is about. Scott, you've been writing about this and talking about this this day on Saturday for quite some time now. What does it mean to you? Well, you know, first of all, <laughs> hats off to Gerald. <laughs> it's, it's tough to follow that kind of passion. I mean, that's why I love the guy, and that's why I like doing this, because uh, we need more of that in America today. We need people to become passionate about our country and passionate about the defense of this country. I uh, I had to laugh when he said, you call me an isolationist. You know, uh, I guess I would be an isolationist, too, except I, I traveled to Russia twice in the last year. Uh, some isolationist, huh? Uh, an isolationist who actually leaves our borders, goes overseas, um, meets with people to learn about the people and bring knowledge and information back. That's the kind of isolation we need more of, as opposed to sitting on our butts here in America, planning on how we can bomb people into submission. But, um, you know, we, uh, Gerald, when I got back from Russia um, and uh, the last time uh, I, I, I met uh, for lunch with uh, Gerald and um and Judge Napolitano, and we were we were talking about a variety of things, and we were talking about this is that they had moved this uh, this rally to uh, September, and um, and Gerald asked if I if I wanted to participate. I said, of course I do. And then I just raised, you know, we were talking what you know what kind of themes you would use, and I I said, well, I said, look, to me the most important issue right now is preventing a nuclear war. Yeah. Um, nothing else matters. I mean, not that nothing else matters, but nothing else matters if we're dead. Um, you know, I, I, there's no denying that there's so many people out there who feel strongly about abortion. There's no denying there's people who feel strongly about gun rights, feel strongly about immigration. All these are are issues that divide the country, and you know, we we should have a honest debate, discussion, and dialogue about it. But we can't have that debate, discussion, and dialogue if we're dead. And I tried to impress upon Gerald and uh, and Judge Napolitano uh, what I felt was the 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 fact that we were heading down a path towards nuclear confrontation and um they eventually bought into it, it as a tough sale because you know at that time uh you know they're they're like well yeah but i mean really is it really that bad uh come on scott let, let's focus on, i mean i remember gerald and i were going back and forth on gaza uh, gaza's a huge issue genocide it's i mean there's no doubt about it and uh, and i said i i i think we're we if we emphasize Gaza above all else, we're missing the point because we can't resolve the Gaza issue if we're dead. And there's going to be a nuclear conflict if we don't try to head it off. And Gerald, with the wisdom that he has, said, yeah. And so that's where I came up with uh, what I call Operation Dawn, uh, basically four questions I asked the American public. Uh, what would you do to save democracy, to save America, to save the world through your vote in November? Uh, because by positioning this rally to September 28th, we were positioned to actually have 
relevance in the election. There's enough time between motivating people on September 28th and the vote on November 5th where we can actually, you know, have the potential of creating momentum amongst the electorate about issues that matter. And um, and so that that's what we bought into. Um, a couple things have, have happened since then. Um, we almost all died on September 14th. Um, uh, and I and I hope people, you know, when I wrote that, I know there's some people, I don't know, Joe, did you roll your eyes too? Going, well, there goes Scott again, uh, you know, fear-mongering, uh, uh, you know, making a mountain out of a molehill. Yeah, it's serious, but it's not that... I hope you listen to what the Russians just did uh, yesterday with the release of the new nuclear posture. Um, everything I said about September 14th uh, is true. That's the Russian position. And now they put it in writing. And I hope people understand that if we had released the storm shadows, there would have been a nuclear war. and We'd all be dead. And yet there's still people out there saying, why not? Let's do this. We can't do this because we'll all die. This is as serious as it gets. This rally couldn't come at a more important time. But there's other things that happened, too. The U.S. government has declared war on free speech and on a free press. Joe, you know that more than anybody. Your consortium news has been attacked, uh, accused of you know being a, a Russian agent, et cetera. There's, there's no better person to speak out in defense of a free press than you. But we also need to speak out in defense of free speech. Um, I have had the FBI come to my house and speak take steal my electronics they stole it they didn't they, the, the search warrant they had was based upon probable cause that doesn't exist they manufactured a case there's literally nothing on these computers that that or the cell phone that they took that shows anything they asked me all the questions i answered all the questions but they still stole my electronics and then they went and stole my archive of the United Nations material that made the case that there were no weapons of mass destruction. The archive I relied upon to stare everybody down. There's a reason, Joe, why I was so adamant about my case, because not only did I live it, I had all the receipts. No one could contradict me. No one. When I said something, it was 100% fact, backed up by documents. And everybody backed down because they knew, I knew, and they knew that I could prove it. You know, sometimes people know, but if you don't have the receipts, they can create doubt and, and all that. By having literally tens of thousands of pages of documents, um, I could back everything I set up, and it it made my position unassailable. They took that. I don't have that archive anymore. U.S. government has it. They claim they'll return it once they review it, but it's gone. And this is the U.S. government. I don't know if I'll ever see those documents again. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to fight for them, but they stole the document. They stole the truth. And that's where we are today, where the U.S. government has declared war against free speech. They, I mean, look at two standards they've established recently. One, disinformation. This is a new legal standard. It came out during the Uhura 3 trial. Disinformation is not bad information, uh, lies, distortions, deceit. Disinformation can be the truth, but it's still disinformation if it deviates from the official government narrative. That is a perversion of free speech that I've never heard of before. The whole concept of free speech is to allow we, the people, to be able to push back against the deceptions of the government by, by speaking freely, by challenging. But now the government's saying, no, no, no. If you challenge us, that's disinformation. And there's another standard that's come out, too. It's uh, related to RFK Jr. Uh, it's called malinformation. Malinformation, again, isn't bad information. Mal normally means bad. Not bad in the sense of inaccurate. Malinformation is accurate information that's inconvenient to the U.S. government. These are two standards out there. This is sickening, sickening. We don't have a republic worth defending if we don't have free speech, and there's a frontal assault on free speech right now. So how can I and Gerald and you and others go out there and trying to convince people that our policy is heading us down a highway to hell towards Armageddon right now, today. We could all die now. If Joe Biden sides off a piece of paper that allows the storm shadow to fall, we won't survive 48 hours. It's over. Game, set, match. And yet I'm not allowed to talk about it. They're going to silence me. They sent the FBI to my house. I'm somehow interfering with the American election, but raising the most important issue of our time. Nuclear war, how to stop it. It's not fake, people. It's not artificial. I'm not fear-mongering. We almost all died on September 14th. What the hell are you going to do about it? And that's why we're having the rally on September 28th, to ask that question to people. I want them to be furious. I want them to be angry. I want them to be empowered by their anger, to say, we can do something. You know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. You've heard that saying before. 
I like to use that analogy when it comes to America, democracy, and the vote. All those people out there right now who said, I'm voting for Donald Trump. You guys don't count anymore. You're done. You gave your vote away. No one cares about you. No one's going to do anything for you because you've already sold your vote. Same thing for those who say, I'm voting for Kamala Harris. You don't matter. Kamala Harris isn't going to do anything for you. I'm voting for Jill Stein. Great. No one cares about you anymore. You know what all the politicians care about right now? The person that says, I don't know who I'm voting for. I want to know more about this, the squeaky wheel. And now the politicians go, oh, God, we got squeaky wheels over there. They're going to put the political grease on it. That means they're going to come in and say, hey, what do I have to say to win your vote over? You see that with immigration. You see that with uh, abortion. You see that with gun control, the squeaky wheel. People are applying um, the grease to it. I want to make defending free speech and preventing a nuclear war the squeakiest wheels out there. I want politicians to say, we have to answer this because if we don't, those votes aren't coming to us. And people will say, well, that's almost an impossible standard to meet, Scott. How do you do that? I'll tell you how you did it. Um, I played a role in getting RFK Jr. and Donald Trump Jr.'s op-ed piece published in The Hill. Okay, they published an op-ed piece that it's not perfect. It's a start, though. They're the first major campaign that's come out and said, we have to stop this war in Ukraine because it's leading us down the path of potential nuclear war, and we have to prevent a nuclear war. See, this is the discussion we want. And on, after, after Saturday, I'm hoping that we can press pressure on Jill Stein. I'd love to see Jill Stein write an op-ed like that, too. Put it down there. You know why it's important that Jill Stein does it? Because she's being accused of stealing votes from Kamala Harris. So now Jill Stein puts people down there and people go, I like that. More people gravitate to Jill Stein. Kamala Harris is going to have to go, how do I win these voters back? She's going to have to put something down. And it better be something that says how to end the war and how to prevent nuclear war. And now we've got a good old fashioned bidding war going on between these campaigns. Who can outbid the other when it comes to putting down sound policy about getting out of Ukraine and getting out of uh, and preventing nuclear war? And now, guess what? We made our votes matter. We made our votes count. And that's what democracy in this constitutional republic is all about. Um, and so that's that's why I'm doing this. I'm excited to be with Gerald. I'm excited to be with you, Judge Napolitano, Max Blumenthal, Anya Perempel, um, uh, Randy Credico is going to come and do a little bit. Um, you know, we've got a great Roger Waters is going to come yeah. in and uh, and do a live presentation and, and, and do a wonderful uh, video presentation of his music uh, related to this. This is going to be a day of empowerment, day really. Empowerment. It's empowering for us as speakers, it, 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 but it's more empowering for the people that are going to be there. I want everybody who's within striking distance of Kingston, and Gerald wants it too, we want to shut Kingston down. I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in a good way, the best possible way. I want people to come in and participate in this actively. And if you can't, we are streaming this live. And you will have plenty of options. Um, we've been putting out the various uh, uh, stream. We'll, we'll put more information out tomorrow. Watch it live. And then what we're going to do is we're going to cut it up and we're going to rebroadcast things and keep this on people's mind, keep it on the menu of people between now and Election Day. This is a day of empowerment. And I want everybody to come out and be empowered. That's what being an American citizen is all about, not being passive couch potatoes and sheep being led to the slaughter by people who don't care about us, but being we the people of the United States holding our elected representatives accountable for what they do in our name and making sure that before they get elected, they hear what we care about and they, they conform to us. So there it is. Time is of the essence and that my eyes did not roll when you wrote that piece. I understand completely the incredibly perilous time that we're living in right now. And unfortunately, it's not, people don't seem to be aware of that as they may have been during the Cold War, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, which I also remember there was a huge awareness, but that doesn't seem to be the case. I wonder why that is, Scott. Why do you think people aren't as aware now of the danger of nuclear weapons, even though we're closer now than maybe probably were even in 1962? Well, I think there was a, um, a continuity of... Um of threat awareness uh, when from the time we dropped the two atomic bombs on Japan and the American people became aware of the horrors of nuclear weapons. Um, and then the, the, the proliferation of nuclear weapons uh, 
entire generations growing up with duck and cover, uh, being told to be afraid of nuclear weapons. We were trained from a very young age to fear nuclear weapons, and they were a part of it. So we had an awareness of there's the Cuban Missile Crisis. We all almost died. Um, I was one year old. I don't remember it, but my parents do. My parents remember holding me, watching the TV as the Soviet ships made their way to that uh, to the to the the, the uh, blockade line. And if they crossed it, we were going to sink them. Then they were going to nuke us. We were going to nuke them. And it's all she wrote. Um, you know the, the the Berlin Wall crisis, the whole the Cold War, the arms race. I mean, all of us are old enough to remember Ronald Reagan and Strategic Defense Initiative. Uh, we remember, you know. The, the very the peacekeeper missile being developed. We remember the controversy about uh, mobile midget man and all this stuff because these were nuclear weapons. We're like, holy cow, we're going to die. Europe remembers the, um, you know, when, when the United States was going to deploy intermediate nuclear forces into Europe in the early 1980s, um, you know, the, and, uh, and, 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 and millions of people went into the streets to protest this. A million people went into the streets in, in 1982 to protest nuclear a million americans got off their asses and went to central park and said hell no and the government had to listen they had to listen people made movies the day after ronald reagan this cold warrior watched it and said that changed his life and he said we have to get rid of these weapons he became passionate about it the, the man who called the soviet union the evil empire is the man who initiated getting rid of nuclear weapons i was part of that process the first damn inspector on the ground in the Soviet Union to help disarm these weapons. I'm very proud of that legacy. Um, and then peace broke out. The Cold War ended. We declared victory. Russia was defeated. And we stopped being afraid. And since the end of the Cold War, we've had multiple generations of people who aren't afraid. They don't fear nuclear weapons because nuclear weapons left their mindset. Um, America was the sole remaining superpower. We had an unmatched nuclear arsenal. Nobody could threaten us. And then we became addicted to the nuclear weapons. Instead of giving them up, we said, man, this empowers us even more. We got these nukes and we became comfortable with nukes. They became so comfortable with nukes, we started about using them because there was no threat. We used to have mutually assured destruction. Use a nuke, we all die. But now we have nuclear supremacy. So we say we can use nukes. We can incorporate them. We saw that happen after 9-11 where we are allowed ourselves to think about preemptively using nuclear weapons in a non-nuclear environment. And it continues to this day. That's our policy. We actually had a deputy um, uh, secretary of defense, assistant secretary of defense uh, during the Trump administration who gave a speech before the Arms Control Association. And he said it was the goal of the Trump administration that every morning the Russians and Chinese leaders would wake up not knowing if today was the day that they were going to get nuked by the United States. That's insanity, but that was official American policy. And it's the official policy of the Biden administration today. And the American people, we would have we would have run Richard Nixon out of the White House had he said that. We would have run, you know, any president out of the White House if they said, yeah, guess what, America? I want to wake up and make the other side think we're going to nuke them today. We go, no, <laughs> then we die because we understood the consequences. You know, we were we, we were a generation that listened to Jack Kennedy give a speech at American University uh, in 1963 about, you know, putting ourselves in the in the shoes of the of the Soviets to see their perspective on things, to try and understand where they were coming from so that we could find a way to avoid nuclear war. My God, what a thought. And yet today, when I travel to Russia, I'm condemned. When I travel to Russia to try and understand what's going on in their heads, what's going on in their souls, what they're thinking about, I'm condemned as an agent of Putin. No, I'm an agent of truth. And I want every American to be an agent of truth. But we literally, we don't fear nuclear weapons, which is, I've made it my job to scare the living poop out of every American. Not because of trying to be irresponsible, because it's a damn real threat, guys. When it goes off, and I'll, and I'll say this I, it, you know, in Kingston, you know, when a when a one megaton bomb goes off over Kingston, over the four corners, one mile out will turn instantly into a flash. Everything will instantly be destroyed, instantly. Turn to ash and fire, a huge fireball wipes everything out. Nine miles out on each side, there will be a blast wave that goes in and flattens every structure. And the heat is so intense, it will melt everything. If you're there, you turn to ash, you die. Beyond that, fires will go for dozens of miles. Um, and then there's the radiation. 
But you think about where you are in Kingston, this birthplace of democracy, all the wonderful things that are nearby, Hyde Park, uh, Rhinebeck, all the beautiful things, all gone. That's just one nuclear weapon. We have thousands of them. And if there's a general nuclear war, we'll have thousands of them going off. And then what happens? Nuclear winter. It's a guarantee. It's not a hypothetical. When you have thousands of megatonnage going off, you will inject radioactive soil into the, into the atmosphere. The sun will be blotted out. A new ice age will come in and everybody will die of hunger, disease, or exposure to radiation. There will be no survivors. And we're still not scared. I mean, we panicked as a nation over coronavirus. <laughs> That's nothing compared to what the hell is going to happen if there's a nuclear war. All right. Get scared, America. Hell, you're willing to line up and take a vaccine that wasn't tested. That's your business. Why not line up and say, let's stop a nuclear war? How confident are you, Scott, that the Pentagon can continue to stop this from happening? Because they're the ones who brought the world back from the brink on September 14th. Austin stood down blinking. And Starmer, who came here, the British prime minister. How confident are you that the realists in the Pentagon will continue to prevail? If this wasn't an election year, I'd be very confident. But this is an election year. And Ukraine's becoming an issue. You see that with Zelensky's visit here. You see how it's being politicized. That son of a bitch, excuse my language, went to a factory together with the governor of Pennsylvania who signed a damn artillery shell. That man should be bitch slapped into the earth. I don't mean to promote violence. I don't want to promote violence. So it's a figurative speech. But my God, he signed an artillery shell. An American, we are not at war with Russia. I want to remind every American watching that. Remember that. We are not at war with Russia. Why the hell are we signing artillery shells designed to kill Russians? Uh, like, this is like disgusting. Interrupt. You also should mention that Nikki Haley went to Israel and she signed artillery shell there that said finish them exclamation yeah. point and talking about nuclear war how about the samson option if israel starts losing they go nuclear yeah. everybody could google it up samson option and now the escalation of the hezbollah war bombing lebanon and again just before we went just as we came on the air I went to um, <clears throat> Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper. Diplomatic sources. Netanyahu backtracked on agreements with U.S. regarding Hezbollah truce due to political pressure. And he says they're going to keep ramping up the war. So it's not only the nuclear war there. It's also whether they have between 200 to 400 uh, nuclear warheads. And again... That's not my language, it's their language, the Samson option. Yeah. And they're gonna they're gonna lose. I mean, you don't have to be good at math. If they get Iran gets dragged into this, what do you have? Nine million uh, Israelis and about you know, about 20% of them Arab? And what do you have? 91 million Iranians? And they're an advanced nation, they're not a third world nation. They have excellent artillery and, and armaments. So if Israel loses, they say, and they're going to go Samson option. They're going to go nuclear. Yep. And that's something we have to talk about. I mean, how we have this double standard. And again, ask yourself, why the United States is failing diplomatically, Gerald? Why can't we stop a war in the Middle East? Well, because Nikki Haley signs a damn artillery shell. So who's going to sit down and talk to Americans and trust Americans when our politicians are going over there kowtowing to the Israelis, uh, being bought by the Israelis, signing artillery shells, wishing the Israelis to kill people, and then we're supposed to have any credibility when we sit down to negotiate a settlement? There's a reason why the yep. Hamas and Hezbollah and the Arab world doesn't trust us anymore, and it's personified by Nikki Haley signing that damn, that damn artillery shell. It was a disgusting act. The fact that she signed that means she doesn't know what it's about. The Pentagon uh, knows what war is, and that's why... That's yeah, why they're trying to stop a nuclear just, war. Yeah. yeah. But you're worried yeah. that because it's an election year, they may There's they too may much pressure. Kamala Harris cannot be seen as um she can't have the failed Ukrainian policy on her shoulders. This is actually an opportunity for her to call it a failed policy and say it's not my policy. My policy is to get out of this war. My policy is to stop a nuclear war. Uh for her to say there have been mistakes made. 
Exactly. Those mistakes, you know, yeah, the investment was made politically by yeah. Biden, not by her. So this could give an opportunity to get to back away now, where if Biden had won, it might not have been as easy. The question is, will she do it? And no, I don't she think she's going to do it. it. No, listen to her camp. Listen to her uh, when she was, uh, you know, at the Democratic convention. She was so she came out so pro Ukraine war. She didn't stop. Right. She, yeah. but, but Gerald, if 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 Jill Stein committed hard, hard on on this with you know, get out of Ukraine, wrote something that that it, that resonated with people, and I've been telling Jill, I'll help her. I want her to do well on this one. I'll help her. Um, and and then people start saying, "I'm going to give my vote to to uh, to Jill." Kamala is going to panic, and then and then she might come out and say, I, "You know, yep. I mean, look, it's worth a try." Yeah, Otherwise, yeah, absolutely. you know, she's absolutely. walked into this position that's just going to get us all killed. <laughs> but Scott, I'm really glad that you mentioned the uh, what happened in the 1980s in Central Park, the campaign for nuclear disarmament in Britain. They people got on the street and they actually affected policy and led to tell us a little bit what arms deals did that directly lead to and what is the state of arms control right now since then in the early 1980s um what happened is we were moving in a good direction with arms control the strategic arms limitation talks the second the second version of it uh was in in the process of being ratified and this 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 was going to limit weapons and begin the process moving us into reductions but then the soviet union invaded afghanistan in 1979 and jimmy carter uh, pulled out of that. So that led to a freeze, no talks whatsoever. Um, in the late 1970s, the uh, Soviets modernized their intermediate nuclear forces. These are uh, weapons that have a range of 500 to 5,000 kilometers. Um, they built something called the SS-20, uh, which is a road mobile missile that had three nuclear warheads. And this dramatically changed the balance of power. The SS-20 was literally a game changer. Uh, the Soviets now had a Prior to that, the missiles they had were the ones that go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, liquid fuel missiles that have to be fueled. It takes a long time. It's detectable. Uh, they can be interdicted. Um, and, and so nobody really lost too much sleep over that. But now they got the SS-20, which is a longer range, can be further back. It's fired. It's road mobile. It's solid fuel. And um, basically, the, the Soviets had the strategic advantage over NATO and Europe there. So we had to counter that um, by deploying our own intermediate forces, the Pershing II uh, and the ground-launched cruise missile. Um, Europe viewed this as inherently destabilizing because it was. It turned literally all of Europe into a nuclear target for the Soviets. Um, but you know, we, we did it, but nobody was talking. There was no negotiations taking place, uh, and this deployment was happening. It happened. But in 1982, a million people went into Central Park and said no. And that, uh, when you put a million people, when a billion people apply themselves to an issue, politicians listen. Um, and then in Europe, you had, again, 1983, 1984. 1983, uh, uh, the German government came down. October 1983, uh, the German government collapsed because of, largely because of uh, the support they had given to the deployment of intermediate range uh, missiles. Um, the collapse, there was, uh, Europe was in an uproar and we had to pay attention to that. And so what happened is, you had, uh, there, there's a great figure in American history named Paul Nietzsche. Um, he's a cold warrior. Uh, he, I mean, Paul Nietzsche, uh, he, you know, his, his, uh, his, his autobiography is from Hiroshima to Glasnost, um, meaning that he's been throughout it all. But he, he, he was the guy who led the uh, a commission that went to Hiroshima after the atomic bomb was dropped to do the investigations. Uh, he's the guy that uh, turned uh, Kinnon's long telegram into containment policy. He's the original Cold Warrior, and he was there in every decision ever made about the Cold War. And um, Ronald Reagan um, appointed him to be head of the um, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces uh, negotiation delegation, but they just weren't talking. And the, the Soviets had a guy, an ambassador there, and they weren't talking. They, they both were looking at it saying, guys, this is very dangerous because with these weapons deployed, one mistake, one miscalculation, one misjudgment, and we're going to have a nuclear war that's going to quickly expand. We have to bring it into this. So they went, because of this pressure, they carried out what they call the walk in the woods. And they got together on their own, two guys, no permission to do this, went on a walk in the woods and sat down and said, how do we kickstart this thing? And they came up with an idea. 
and they sent it back to their respective bosses, uh, who immediately shot it down and chastised both of them. Uh, you know, Richard Pearl, the Prince of Darkness, how dare you do this? And the 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 the, the, the Soviet guy got yelled at. But then the 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 Soviets and the Ameri American leadership went. We, wait a minute, we, we got to fix this. We got to figure this out. And eventually we started talking again because of the pressure being brought to bear. Nothing happens in a vacuum. You've got to put pressure on things. If the people get off their asses, get in the streets and say, this matters to us, Kamala Harris, Donald Trump, Jill Stein are going to feel empowered by that to make the right decision. All politicians are cowards at heart. None of them want to create controversy. None of them want to get ahead of an issue out of fear of losing an election. But if we, the people, define the issue and say, if you do this, we will support you, then they will do this. And that's what happened with INF. And what ended up happening is um, in 1987, Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev sat down and signed the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty that got rid of all of these destabilizing weapons, all of them. And it wasn't just the, the, the treaty. They set in motion... Um, the verification of this treaty, because that was always a tough part with arms control. How do you verify the other side's telling the truth? Um, and the best way to do it is put human inspectors on the ground. But uh, <laughs> nobody wanted human inspectors because they're spies and all this kind of stuff. INF Treaty created the on-site inspection agency. The Soviets had their, their version, and inspectors came over and did the job of verification, on-site inspection, and it worked. And then what we said is we can take this and we can apply it to strategic weapons. And the START Treaty was signed. And we started reducing arsenals. We went from 30,000 weapons in the 1980s to 1,550 today. 30,000 weapons to 1,550 today. All we need to destroy the world is 400. Now, I'd like to get below that. So we're not destroying the world. And I'd like to get to zero. Well, but right now, arms control is dead. Donald Trump withdrew from the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty because we felt that we had to have weapons to take on the Chinese that we couldn't have because of the treaty with the Russians. The Russians were like, please don't pull out of this. This is a very dangerous thing. Destabilize it. Uh, George Bush pulled out of the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, which is the foundation of all stability because with that treaty, mutually assured destruction's ingrained in the mind. But now when you think you can build a missile defense, you have an artificial sense of security that emboldens you to do stupid things nuclear yeah. policy-wise. The last treaty that we have with the Russians is the New START Treaty. This is the one with the 1,550 cap. Uh, it expires on February 26, 2026. And when it expires, there's nothing to replace it. The United States, the Biden administration has already said that when it's expired, the United States is going to build nuclear weapons without limitation. We are going to rapidly expand our nuclear arsenal without limitations, building new categories of nuclear weapons. And the Russians will have to match it. The Chinese are already matching it. And next thing you know, all these low levels we have are going to spring right back up. And there's no arms control. to pre Arms control isn't just about reducing weapons. It's confidence building. One of the key aspects of these treaties was having Americans and Russians work side by side to accomplish the goal of preventing nuclear war. Meeting people, talking to people, you build confidence, you build relationships, so that if there's a crisis, you can pick up the phone and you know the guy on the other end. You've met with him, you've worked with him. Uh, he knows you, so you can talk to each other as you know, not just you know, professionals, but as colleagues, colleagues of peace, colleagues of disarmament, colleagues to try and prevent war. Today, I, I, I went to the Russian embassy on September 13th, Friday, uh, to attend a, 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 a cultural event put together by the Russian ambassador Anatoly Antonov, a piano concert, Rimsky Korsakov, a beautiful event. Um, there, you know, because of my military background, I get along pretty good with the defense attaches, and I've, I've met with them every time I've gone there. Um, these are the guys that are, they're, that are brought here so they can talk to their American counterparts to have this kind of relationships. So the questions can be asked and answers can be had so we can learn about each other so that when somebody says, what will the Russians do? You can say, well, let me call up the attache. Hey, how are you guys feeling about this? Hey, the attaches feel this, that, and the other thing. It's the way it works. They're not talking to anybody. They're frustrated because they are scared just like I am. They're sitting there going, this is getting out of control. This thing's going spinning out of control. Our job is to talk to people, calm this down. We got our defense attaché supposed to be talking to the Secretary of Defense. Nobody's talking to him. Nobody's calling. 
the ambassador Anatoly Antonov is a genuine American expert. He negotiated New Start. There's no better person positioned to breathe life back into arms control than Anatoly Antonov, and we won't talk to him. This is the crazy part. The crazy part. And that's why Saturday is such an important event. Uh, and I'm going to turn to you, Gerald, to close the program. Tell people how they can get up there. What are the facilities and how many people can you accommodate? And uh, and what do you expect to come from? Well, the as far what we can accommodate, we can accommodate as many as they want to come. Uh, we have security here as well and a great security team. They're the off-duty Kingston police. So we're protected in every way. If there's going to be any kind of problems, they're on our side. And again, they, they said they'll close down the streets. We get enough people here. And so it's up to the people to come. And uh, you go to Occupy Peace, OccupyPeace.com for more information. And please consider donating. You know, as I mentioned, the uh, podcast I did tonight, how Camilla, it was a story in the New York Times today. They call it the paper record. I call it the toilet paper record. Front page story, this big thing about, look at all this stuff. It's about Lauren Powell Jobs has been a confidant of Vice President Kamala Harris for years. And it goes on to say how the billionaires are basically running the show. And it's up to we, the people. that they, no, They're billionaires. They, they're allowed to come to the White House. The billionaires are allowed to do anything that they want. We're just plantation workers of Slavelandia. I mean, there's a lot of crap. As Scott was saying, it's about the people taking the action. It's about the people doing something. Day of empowerment. That's what he said. It's a day of empowerment. You know, it's our lives. Who the hell are they to tell us what to do? So <laughs> that's it. I mean, if we don't unite for peace, we're going to die in war. Again, Scott went over in detail about the nuclear annihilation. It's Again, just quickly, this is from what Putin said on Wednesday, quote, it is proposed that aggression against Russia by any non-nuclear state, but with the participation or support of a nuclear state be considered as their joint attack on the Russian Federation. We reserve the right to use nuclear weapons in case of an aggression against Russia and Belarus, including if the enemy using conventional weapons creates a critical threat to our sovereignty. Right there. Right there. And another $8.7 billion stealing our money as our country's right in front of us to give to Ukraine to make sure that this happens. And right. again, on the Israeli front, the war is heating up against Hezbollah. It's one article after another that's coming out that illustrates the hypocrisy. IAF chief preventing all weapon transfers from Iran to Hezbollah now top priority. This is Major General Tom Barr, you know, the Israeli. Oh, prevent all weapon transfers from Iran to Hezbollah? Hey, but the United States and Europe, they can send all the weapons they want to Russia. What hypocrisy. That's why everyone has to try to get up to Kingston on Saturday. If you're in northern New Jersey, New York City, Westchester County, Connecticut, western Massachusetts, upstate New York, get to Kingston. What time does it begin, Gerald? It begins at 2 p.m. And it's right off the New York State Thruway, like three minutes. So we're very, very you just get right off exit 19 in the Thruway, and you're, and you're right here. Excellent. And yeah. So please, please come and, and bring as many people as you can and spread the word for peace. Very good, Gerald. Very good words to end this. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Gerald. We'll see you on Saturday. And uh, for CN Live, this is Joel Lawrence saying goodbye. And tune in. If you can't get there, it'll be live streamed on numerous places, including on Consortium News. Bye-bye.